Good evening and welcome to this special Music and Ideas presentation for International Women's Day, Women in Music. Tonight's event is supported by the City of Melbourne and is proudly presented by Equity Trustees. I would like to begin by paying my respects to the traditional custodians of the land upon which we are gathering today, the people of the Kulin Nation and acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. My name is Thasneem Chopra and I am a cross-cultural consultant delighted with the opportunity to facilitate a conversation between some very talented individuals in the music sector. And tonight, those individuals are multi-award winning composer, arranger and conductor, Vanessa Perica, Catherine B Bartholomew's Plows, Melbourne Symphony Orchestra's Head of Artistic Planning, Catherine, hi. Dr. Amanda Coles, researcher and senior lecturer at Deakin University, and Professor Margaret Barrett, head of Monash University's Sir Zelman Cowan School of Music and Performance. So as you can see, there's a wealth of talent and capacity and ideas amongst this group. And I'm really excited to hopefully interrogate some of that in the context of what I understand is, yes, International Women's Day, but when women in music are put together, is there, an, is there a disparity? Is there an imbalance in opportunities for them? So in 2017, the MEAA commissioned research to assess the state of gender equity in the Australian music industry. Loosely, the report demonstrated male advantage is a pervasive feature of the industry and using publicly available published data, it interrogated industry dynamics that produced a contemporary music scene in which radio playlists, festival lineups, industry awards, peak bodies and major industry boards were dominated by male contribution and male voices. Now, Amanda, I know that you have yourself undertaken some incredible research and very deep diving research into the state of play of music, and there'll be a lot of puns tonight, so excuse me. <laughs> Can you tell us what are some of the overarching findings you found when you examined gender equity in the music industry? Thanks, Tasmanian. Um, this was a piece of research that was, as you said, conducted in 2017 with, ben, uh, with Professor Ray Cooper at the University of Sydney, as well as Dr. Sally Hannah Osborne, also at the University of Sydney. And we were astonished at the degree to which gender inequality is a defining feature of work and labour markets and indeed the entire industrial ecology of the Australian contemporary music industry. Now I will say that this piece of research was specific um, to contemporary and largely recorded music, but I think lots of the findings in that are relevant for our discussion uh, in relationship to the MSO and classical music more broadly. Key points as follows, and you've hinted to them. Uh, women are largely excluded from key gatekeeping and decision-making roles in the Australian music industry. What are those positions of gatekeeping? And so this includes everything from executive decision-making at individual organizations, at the very top levels of both artistic and organizational leadership, as well as industry leadership. So those governing bodies that help shape policy and strategy and advocacy are overwhelmingly male dominated. So decisions that are taken about the industry exclude women's voices overall. Secondly, we found that men are largely overrepresented across all areas of the ecology from, as you said, from playlists to festivals um, and that accrue, that overrepresentation, the advantage that men experience um, systemically within the industry has compounding negative impacts for women as they try and navigate their way through their careers. So women have fewer opportunities to develop their artistic leadership or their organizational leadership. Women have less exposure to audiences and that has compounding impacts on their career trajectory. It influences the investments that are made in their careers moving forward. And of course, that then has compounding impacts on the income that they are able to wrest from their professional careers as musicians and professionals in the music industry. So it was pretty comprehensive um, and demonstrated a really serious state of affairs, as you've pointed out, for an industry that is overwhelmingly subsidized by public dollars that requires immediate attention. 
Okay, so it's a big issue. Um, Margaret, you're a researcher and you're an educator. Are women just not into music? What, what's, why, why are they not getting anywhere? It's opportunity again, mm -hmm. as, as Amanda has pointed out. It's uh, the ways in which women are systemically barred in some ways. When does, major... that, when does that barring start? Well, it can start in the very early years of education. As, a, as one example, I think of the English Cathedral Choir, mm -hmm. an all-male experience up until the early 90s. A tradition which provided young boys coming into the Cathedral Choir around the age of six with an extraordinary daily education, with performance outcomes several times a week. So that by the time they were at conservatorium entry age, they had an astonishing richness of repertoire skills and development that was denied to girls. And it was only when uh, Salisbury Cathedral Choir, I think it was, in 1992, decided to establish a girls' choir that that began to change. So there are some of these systemic bars that are, are right from the very beginning of experience. Okay, that's a UK example. And yeah, 1992 is a, is a very late coming to, to, coming, to, you know, coming to the party, in a sense, realising that there mm. is underrepresentation of women in that sector. Within an Australian context, what's your experience as someone who's researched um, musicology and researched rather, you know, the uptake of music with younger generations are younger uh, between boys and girls? Are we socialising a patterned behaviour of aspiration to music more so with one gender than another? I think we have to be alert to the ease with which patterned behaviour can become instituted. So, for example, in um, distributing instruments at the very beginning of orchestral experience, um, it's often uh, that the, the girls are given violins and flutes with the perception that they're not physically able uh, to, to be able to cope with a larger instrument. Mm. Sometimes there's, there's even reference to uh, young girls and young women not playing wind and brass instruments in particular because it's, it's not terribly attractive, apparently. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so um, there, are, there are these sort of unspoken ways in which young people might be directed to particular instruments mm -hmm. and particular ways of engaging with music. Okay. Having said that, Vanessa, you're a bit of a... Bit of a rebel. I understand you're a, a trumpetist. I, yeah, trumpeter? I entered the university as a uh, tr trumpet performance major in a jazz course in in Perth. So, but I was one of very few. Um, yeah, typically most of the female students in the course were vocalists. Um, and even just you know a couple of months ago, I had to uh, contact an event organizer and ask them to relist me as a composer as opposed to a vocalist because uh, often the preconception is that if you are a female in jazz, that you must be a Probably are a vocalist. I mean, that's very much changing, but it still happens every now and then. So, but, but yeah, as a, as a female musician in, in quite a senior, you know, quite a senior ranking now, because you're now taking commissions or you receive commissions from the MSO. Congratulations Thank for you. that. Is it a is it a lonely space to be in? It's incredibly lonely. I mean, just as a composer, full stop. <laughs> it's a lonely profession. But yeah, indeed, there aren't too many female composers out there. Why do you it's, think that is? <sighs> I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but I, I, I personally found it very difficult. Once I left uh, university, I um, had this strange penchant for large ensembles and I didn't know how to make a living from that financially. I didn't know how to pay my jazz orchestra, you know, from the door deal and pay them for, you know, so I sort of put it off for a while and, um, and dabbled with other industries, but then I the music was so, you know, calling me so badly, I, I desperately missed it. So I, I am here now, but it's, um, I, I feel like um, I can probably more speak to the jazz uh, world. It's, it's very much a gigging economy and uh, you don't have superannuation, you don't have annual leave, you don't have any job security really unless you do a bit of teaching. So it's, 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 it's not for the faint hearted, you, mm -hmm. have, you have to absolutely love it. And um, I'm glad I'm here now and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, 
I'm lucky to be receiving commissions and it's all going well, but it, it took a lot of time and, and, dare I say, courage for me to get to that point where I felt like I could fully commit to becoming a, a full-time composer because the financial side of things is, is really daunting. Yeah. You, you, I mean, I've heard you talk about how you have seen, you know, droves of young females today compared with, say, 20 years ago who are you know, getting into the to, to wind instrument, to brass instruments and you, you see these aspiring young women who are trumpeteers. And I, I want to ask a question and I'll bring you to, into this, Catherine. What's the trajectory from an aspirant orchestral player who's female to becoming chief conductor? Is it a seamless transition? Are the odds stacked against them? What does that, what does that pathway look like? I think it's incredibly hard for women to break through into becoming a conductor particularly. It's a very male dominated part of the industry. Uh, we are seeing more and more women coming through, but it's a very small pool and there needs to be more uh, investment in training in particular. Can you, give us, like, can you give us a breakdown of the statistics? What are the proportion today of males versus females in the MSO compared mm. with, say, four or five years ago? Absolutely. I wrote this down. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of artists more broadly, so uh, soloists and conductors in our core classical programs, in 2017, 24% of our performers were women. And in 2023, we're hoping around 40% will be women. So the trajectory is, is going up for us and we are consciously making that effort. How do you support that transition? From? from in that percentage up, uptake. I mean, how is, it, how is that going to happen? How is it going to happen? Well, more training opportunities. Um, we can, in, in planning and in programming, we can only choose from the pool of people who are available to us who are trained, who have experience with orchestras who are at a certain level and for us to to get there I, I throw it to Margaret how, how do we how do we get the training to be to, to get more women into into conduct into conducting I think we we probably need specialized programs that are targeted at women um, so thinking about this issue of of conductors when you look at the biographies of conductors many of them are uh, particularly the British conductors, have come through that cathedral choral tradition. That's part of their background. So they are already so far ahead. Uh, so we need programs that are specifically targeted at girls and young women that give them that advantageous education. And I think the more that younger women in particular see female conductors on the podium leading the orchestra, it becomes more acceptable. Yeah, more aspirational. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, you famously said, you said, there are too many white males on the stage and perceived superstars are white men too. There are too few women who are being recognised. Okay. Mm. So, again, who makes a selection? And I'm asking this to you as a person who's not an orchestra buff. Um, so I'm just genuinely looking at an orchestra and I'm seeing, yes, there's, there's far more, it's skewed definitely towards male, but who makes the decision of who gets up there? And how much does leadership, and Amanda, I'll, I'll bring you into this, how influential do you think leadership is in determining who gets selected? I've conducted research across the film industry and the music industry, and we did a comprehensive review of my research team a few years ago of, of six uh, cultural industries in Canada, and the patterns are staggering and global. Um, increasingly, um, I think that the scholars working in this space are of the view that leadership and agency of key decision makers is the piece. Mm -hmm. Because you can fill a pipeline <laughs> full of diverse candidates and still not see that translate into leadership reward and recognition at the highest end of the industry. So yes, I agree that training and filling the pipeline is really important. That is not going to solve the problem. You cannot simply add more people who look different than white men to a system that is hostile right, mm. to diversity. You need to focus on changing the system itself to, to value inclusivity, diversity, and belonging mm -hmm. 
as core industry values. So that work starts with the industrial gatekeepers, right? The organizational gatekeepers, the boards of directors, the chief conductors, the managing directors, the people who have influence and networks and the vision to say, this is not good enough. We have to start doing things differently. The system is broken. We need a different system. Catherine, I'm gonna go back to you just very quickly. I mean, we're talking about making change at leadership in order to understand that it, that's where it starts because if all the training in the world happens but there's no buy-in to actually then officiate change, What's the point? And I know that MSO has recently appointed a female MD. Was, is it recent? How? No, Sophie came on board in 2016. So okay. you can see from, from the stats that I said earlier, from 2017 to 2023, there we've got this right. And mm. I've lived through it. Sophie has made change. What are the kind of changes you've seen? She champions women. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been given you know, agency to appoint Shen Zhang as our principal guest conductor. Um, Who is who's a female? Yeah, Orchestra. very wonderful conductor. female conductor. Yep. Um, and it's being given the agency as a programmer to say, yes, we should be aiming for more women on the stage. And so we go out and we ask agents and we look at reviews with the aim to bring in especially female conductors yeah. to yeah. our stage. And I would add that, I mean, we are talking about gender diversity is International Women's Day, but if we want to get a little bit more intersectional about it, there's, there's more diversity that's also come afoot under, um, Sophie's, mm -hmm. under Sophie's authority. And can you explain some of those? I know it's to do with the Indigenous um, composers and, and artists. Yeah, absolutely. We have um, a new creative chair for First Nations, Deborah Cheatham, who's mm -hmm. come on board um, since becoming, she was our composer in residence um, very recently. So we're, you know, we're exploring that space, becoming more involved in engaging more First Nations peoples. Um, obviously, with exploring diversity in, in every sense of the word um, and, and getting away from more traditional programming. In it's terms a bold, of it's a bold new step and it's exciting to mm. see. And I believe we have a short promo to illustrate the season launch for the MSO, which we're gonna to throw to you now. Certainly promising. Very exciting to see that. <laughs> Very encouraging to see that. Um, but I'm going to be the devil's advocate here and I'm going to throw to you again, Amanda, and you talked, you talk about risks that leaders need to take in order to elicit change and for us to see a seismic shift in the status quo. But often there's something inhibiting that risk. Do you want to expand on that for me, please? Look, I think that the idea of risk um, is a really important one that requires interrogating in relationship both to programming questions as well as hiring questions. So they're in lots of different industries, in lots of different creative industries, and I'll let you guys speak to the specifics of this in relationship to orchestral music, is there is an assumption that um, you program the core, the canon, and that's what's actually going to put your bums on your seats and drive your audiences and hold that core base that is going to sustain your organization. And let's be real, it's been a tough few years, right? So wrap the pandemic around um, an already a sector that already struggles with uh, attracting new audiences and building different kinds of audiences. Um, and you end up in a really, in, in the potential for a really risk averse uh, mm -hmm. context. Um, the problem with being risk averse in your programming is that you then reinscribe, and maybe Margaret, I'll let you talk to some of the problems that come along with only programming the canon and how that actually shuts down 
women's artistic voices and the artistic voices and capacities of musicians from all around the world. There are lots of different kinds of classical music. We just talk about Western classical music in this context. Um, and, and the consequence then of programming those major canon core big symphonic pieces is that you then want to get a really superstar conductor that's going to drive and, and satisfy this is the logic, um, you know, that core audience base. And very often that's how you end up repeating it, the same faces and that's that set of privilege because it's a safe pair of hands in a very big piece that is going to be a linchpin of our programming structure for the year. We see this over and over again. We see this in feature films all the time, you know, where um, men are constantly handed budgets that are two or three times that of women directors. And the rationale that is used to justify one of the factors that drives a gender pay gap, including the gig economy and other networks that are exclusionary to women, et cetera, is that you're putting a high risk project in a safe pair of hands. And by doing that, it obscures the rationales that actually underpin um, gender inequality as a core driver. So I think we really need to interrogate the presumptions across all the creative industries about who our audience is. What does our audience want? Um, what do we want our audience to want? You know, um, And what is the relationship between who gets to tell the stories and what the audiences see? I think that requires some really bold leadership. And I'm pleased to see it looks like the MSO is heading in some really promising direction. Yeah. Margaret, beyond interrogating what the audience wants, where do you think the burden of change rests? I think it rests with all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, the Key Change Initiative mm. is uh, a global initiative that seeks to have parity and equity in terms of gender balance through all levels of the industry. So uh, the initiative asks the industry to take a range of pledge pledges. So in tertiary education, it's a pledge that they will strive for parity between male and female students, between male and female lecturers, between the repertoire that's being brought into uh, the students' experience range, so they're not studying all the same music, etc., with orchestras, etc., to be ha able to have um, equality of gender representation there. It's a great initiative, but built into that, there are still some problems. And three that uh, I, I see, and I, there may be others that Amanda might want to comment on. One, 50-50, too often is seen as the ceiling, where actually mm -hmm. it's a baseline. Mm -hmm. It should be seen as a baseline. So that's one issue. The second, so just break that down, 50-50, you mean gender ratio? Gender ratio. Okay, and you think it could be based purely on merit, it could be, it, it could skew the other way? Well, it's been skewed the other way for a very long mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. So... For historic reasons and structural reasons which you've, you've identified. And if we unpack those, what's it going to produce? If we were looking purely on merit, mm -hmm. were there an equal playing field, which we've already discussed in education, does not necessarily exist. Mm -hmm then we would hope to see far more women okay. than just the 50-50 the we've got to the baseline, let's stop. The second problem that I see with Key Change Initiative, and I'm a great supporter of it, we've committed our school to it, but there is also the, the possibility there that the view is just add women and stir, put all these women in, problem solved. But what that What could does, go wrong with that? <laughs> well, it doesn't necessarily change the behaviour of the individuals and the institutions that have shaped the problem in the first place. Mm. You've just put women in that mix, which can be very toxic. Mm -hmm. The third thing is that you're putting the burden of change on women. They've mm. got to solve the problem, but they didn't actually create the problem. Mm. So they, there are a whole pile of systemic things in there. So we have to think uh, across changes of, of policy, of institutional structures. We have to change hearts and minds of everybody in those organisations, which I think you were referring to, Can to I just earlier. Add one yeah, more please. Thing to that, 
is that, you know, we use the term 50-50 mm -hmm. without really, you know, it's, it, it's become sort of a reflex. But that reinscribes a gender binary. And I think mm. there's lots of discussions yeah. that we've had in this country, i.e. religious discrimination bill, mm -hmm. and otherwise tell us that gender is not a binary, right? Gender is a spectrum of identities. And mm -hmm. it's a really complex and shifting terrain. And we need to uh, move well beyond that men and women framework if we really want to engage with the core issues that mm. um, of exclusion and marginalization across a whole range of intersectional frameworks. That's a broad challenge and it's probably worth another panel for that discussion in <laughs> itself. But I, Catherine, I'm going to throw you in here and ask you, on the issue of gender pay equity, is that something that personally through your own experience that you witness? Is, 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 is this true? Is it happening? And if so, how do you, how do you respond to it? Through my career, yes. I've absolutely experienced men getting paid more for the same role or for similar roles that I'm doing. It's my experience. It, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, and, and it's Vanessa, hard. how much of a deterrent is that, do you think, for women in the field to even want to aspire to further themselves if they're doing the same work, having the same talent, but not being remunerated equally for it? I mean, it makes you so tired. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, you know, I mean, why would, I, I think now looking back, uh, I actually enrolled into architecture because my parents wanted me to get a real job. Yes. So I think there's a bit yes. of that with young women as well. I think their parents are maybe fearful of um, young women signing up for such a, you know. Such a bold change. Mm. Mm, it's, it's true. Um, Amanda, I'm going to ask you again here that um, in terms of um, eliciting, eliciting change from, from leadership, you're talking about it, you know, we, we just can't throw women into the mix and expect things to magically mm -hmm. fix themselves. Mm -hmm. Where do we start? I mean, if, if I was set to, you know, if we would have, you had the opportunity to address the board of MSO and the executive, and you wanted to give them some direction about meaningful change that's going to lead to outcomes, what, where would you actually then start deconstructing the disadvantage? Right. Well, Tasneem, I'm a big fan of structural overhaul, as I'm sure you've picked up by now. So I would ask uh, the MSO and any major arts organization that receives significant public subsidy um, to conduct an equity audit. And an equity audit involves a comprehensive review of all your policies, but importantly, your who processes. Conducts, who conducts that review? I I think someone like a cultural consultant can okay. come, come in. Mm -hmm. uh, or, you, you know, there are experts out there, you can hire researchers, but it's a good idea to um, hire someone from the outside because External, yes. you're going to want to have someone come in and talk to the staff. And it's very, you can't have, it's very challenging to have an honest conversation with someone who is your superior about some of the challenges mm -hmm. perhaps that mm -hmm. you're facing in your journey. So it's not just the policies, because I think we have all been in, in working environments where the policy is written as X, uh, but the implementation of that is either non-existent or takes a different form. So you really go in and, and you do an overhaul starting from the very top of the governance structure. What are the norms and values of the board? What are the values that they say that they espouse? And then how do they enact those values? And where are the gaps? Because there's always going to be gaps. How, I want you to look at your um, hiring and recruitment processes. I want you to look at your retention packages. I want you to interrogate, you know, what are the key selection criteria that you're looking for in some of these key leadership roles? And then also to talk to, gosh, you know, the orchestra and say, what you know, what is it like to be part of the MSO? And um, because I think part of the thing that we haven't really talked about on this panel yet is backlash. And I assume that the journey at the MSO hasn't been straightforward. I don't know. We certainly see this in lots of other sectors where a really strong emphasis on equity, diversity, and inclusion um, has a, a lot of pushback because there are some people have benefited from the system as it stands for a very long time. Um, can, I ask, can I ask you, Catherine, do you, think, do you see that there's an appetite right now, not just for the conversation, but for actually pushing an agenda for diversity, equity and inclusion? Yes, yes, we're, we're having the discussion 
every day. Mm. We, we look at our upcoming seasons and, and we want to ensure that what we're putting on the stage represents as many people as, as possible. And how do you seek that consultative process? Discussion among lots of people. We consult with our artistic committee. We consult with a wide variety of people. It's not just one person who decides what goes on the MSO stage. We have our chief conductor. We have directors of programming. We have lots and lots of roles who all have a part to play and all know that we're pulling in the same direction because of the leadership shown by Sophie. Okay, and of course, I mean, leadership, again, we've discussed that leadership, when it's coming from within an orchestra background and people who've actually got an invested history and understanding the value of it, you're going to see a very different, very genuine um, response and outcome to programming, to content. And, but I want to talk about audience diversification now. And who's coming to the orchestra? Is it, are women coming to the orchestra? Is it, is it, is it again, is it skewed towards... Is it skewed towards a male audience dynamic? And if it is, how do, we, how do we change so that those who come to the orchestra look more representative of, you know, Australia, for example, in 2022? I can't speak to figures. I'm a programmer. I don't work in, in, in our sales department. But I, I know that we are putting forward outreach programs. We are working in places within Melbourne and within Victoria that don't necessarily always see an orchestra. We're going to places like Narra Warren, we're going to Broad Meadows. We're not just performing in Hamer Hall. That's only a part of what we do. We have an amazing learning and engagement department mm. who genuinely, uh, are full of amazing people who genuinely want to broaden our audiences and ensure that as many people as possible can experience the wonderful music that we're, we're creating. Now, Vanessa, your parents wanted you to be an architect, but you <laughs> very rebelliously went and played the trumpet. How important do you think it is for young aspirational musicians to, you know, you can't be what you can't see? Oh, exactly. Right? I actually had a fantastic experience um, at an MSO concert last year, Blood on the Floor at Hamer Hall. I took... Um, my niece along. Uh, she's a young aspiring trombonist and before the concert she was like, oh, I'm not really into practice or, you know, I need to find a good teacher who will make me practice. I, and I said, it needs to come from within, you know, you've got to... Anyway, um, up comes uh, the wonderful Jessica Busby to the front of the stage or on a trombone boat playing a trombone solo and she was so delighted to see a female playing a trombone at the front and her mum tells me that she has not, not stopped practising since. She's been so inspired. And she was even talking about doing tertiary music wow. after that and she'd expressed no interest prior. So it was, I wow. felt so elated to yeah. offer her that experience via yeah. the MSO. It was really, really touching. So, yeah. I think, nice. and I mean, I think Margaret, you and even Amanda have spoken about, even from an audience perspective, seeing females perform on stage, seeing female conductors lead, how aspirational that can be. Um, I mean, is there any data or research that you can point to that, you know, that speaks to how influential it is to be validated and seeing you know, your own gender up there performing? There's quite a lot of work in music education that's now looking at how uh, presenting young people with, with aspirational models becomes a significant factor mm -hmm. in their decisions to engage with music and actually to practice, mm -hmm. <laughs> as you, you made that point. Um, and I, it, it, we cannot um, overestimate how important it is to be able to see yourself, to imagine yourself into a space, into a possibility, and if you are looking at a room as a, a young woman trombonist and there's no women at all, then you think, oh, it can't be for yeah. me. Yeah. And it's not a possibility. So it's, it's vitally important that we nurture women into these roles and move away from the risk-averse view of the world. Um, Amanda speaking about the, the notion of risk-averse. When we look at a lot of, of programming, the, the female soloist, the female conductor, mm. is usually conducting the, the new work mm. that's mm. very short because we don't want to risk the entire program going. So it's just the short new one, which was a bit of a taster. And if it worked, well, that's nice. But if not, we know it's going to be over in 10 minutes and we're on to the next thing. 
So, so often women are put into so very... So how, how do we revisit those structures that will maybe continuously or historically pitching women as the guinea pig, if for want of a better phrase, um, so that, you know, women can get the opportunities that are safe, that are promising, that are, you know, secure. How do we, how do we make that, who makes that decision that determines the women are going to be in a, in a safe, secure position and who doesn't? I mean, is that a question you can answer? It's a programming decision, isn't it? And you're making it. Yeah, absolutely. Whenever we welcome a conductor to the MSO, we want to make sure that they're comfortable with the program that is jointly discussed and chosen. Mm -hmm. There's no point putting them up there to, to work on a program that is going to put them at a disadvantage, mm -hmm. male or female. Mm -hmm. We want the best possible result from them and from the orchestra. Because if they're uncomfortable, it's not going to make good music. Yeah. Um, so bringing in a, a, a female conductor who's having her debut or a male conductor who's having his debut with the orchestra, it's a discussion about what's going to get them the best result with us mm -hmm. so that we can hopefully build on a relationship and keep on inviting them back. And that said, um, the MSO has retained a female in residence. Uh, a principal guest a princi conductor, yes. Principal guest Jen, conductor. as you saw in the, in the video earlier. Yes. Mm -hmm. so that's, I, I just yeah. wanted to pipe in and say the, the MSO took a risk on me by commissioning me for the first time last year. Um, and I have to give massive props to the amazing Matt Hoy, who heard my uh, debut album with my jazz orchestra and um, gave me a call one day and asked me how I'd feel about uh, writing a suite with that album for jazz orchestra and the MSO. And to put that on at the Sydney My Music Bowl with, I was unknown, like I was, a, you know, and I'm the jazz person <laughs> with my big band. And, um, at, you know, it's such a big venue and that um, was completely life-changing for me. I've not stopped receiving commissions. So that I, they've taken a huge risk on me and it's, um, I'm very thankful to them. So I just wanted to, you know, give, give them some and, credit, and you artists, know. Artists on stage are only part of the picture. Yeah. There are lots of female uh, writers, composers, um, working right now. And, and we're commissioning them. We are, mm. absolutely. Um, and only more and more, the pandemic um, has actually brought that to a fore. When we were focusing on local performers, we were, uh, during the pandemic, borders closing, we also focused on commissioning local mm. artists, local composers, to write works for our own musicians. Uh, can, can, can I ask women. what the gender balance was on that? since we're doing gender equity. Absolutely. I can't speak to that specific <laughs> here, but I can give you a direction of where we're going. It, it's very dependent on who sits within our artistic family mm -hmm. for the year. So who's our composer in residence, as I mentioned earlier, like Deborah Cheatham, who's our young composer in residence, but we're on a journey. So in 2018, 19% of our commissions were written by women. However, in 2023, we hope that 66% of our commissions okay. will be written by women. As I said, it, it is very dependent on, on the personalities at play in any given season, but that's, that's a clear indication that we're moving in the right direction and, and we want to be there. We want to be at the front we of We are, and it's, it, again, it's encouraging to see the orchestral world keeping up with, I guess, the, the tone of, of gender politics globally. I mean, if we're not presenting more women at the front, if we're not seeing more female composers, more artists on stage, if the audiences aren't filling up with more of a gender balance even, at least, how then are we keeping up with the rest of the world that's telling us that women are, we have a Me Too movement, we have a global movement of saying enough is enough. So mm -hmm. seeing, these, seeing these steps at this point to me, and, and, and if we just, you know, if the MSO and institutions like the MSO are reading the room, there's almost a, com, you know, a, a compunction on them to, to respond, to be aware, to be responsive in, in how they hire, how they recruit, how they pay and how they retain quality, you know, f uh, female, female uh, employees and artists and, and, and musicians. Amanda, can I ask you, have you seen examples in your research of institutions that have got it right, got the tone right, got the balance right, got the outcomes right? Oh, close to, um, I can't tell from your expression if that's <laughs> too far-fetched a question. Oh dear, I'm reading the eyes. You've caught me a little bit on the hop, Tasneem, because I'm sure they're out there. 
Um, look, I, let me, what I can say is this. Mm -hmm. There is, as you've suggested, a global agenda to change the way who makes our culture, how that culture is distributed, how we understand the culture, who gets to see the culture and how it's accessed. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, the hashtag Me Too movement that was the groundswell that sort of caught on in a whole bunch of different industries built on years of advocacy um, around issues of intersectional inequality. And because this matters, it's, you know, it, the creative industries are both a place of work and employment and careers and livelihoods for people who deserve to make a living out of um, the creative process. It is also a really important social space, you know, as we've suggested. Absolutely. You can't be what you can't see. And our, our arts and music and screens and visual arts, they don't just reflect the world, they shape the world mm -hmm. that we're in. Music is by definition a political space, right? It mm -hmm. is a place where yeah. we can test yeah. and articulate social norms and values. Um, and that's what makes it so rich. And then you layer on the pandemic where everybody gets locked out, especially in Melbourne longest, I think, or second longest in the world. And what did we turn to? right? We turned to music. So who yeah. made record amounts of money? Spotify and Netflix and the video game industry went, Psh, live performance, not so much, mm -hmm. some very agile thinking by our live performance sector. But what it really did was underscore how important this is to our daily existence. So both as an economic and employment driver, but also as a key component of our social fabric. So I think we have a real opportunity here, and I think there's lots of really good experiments happening internationally and within Australia. I think that we have some really good signs here um, that change is underway. I just want to make sure that that change becomes core practice. Because we've been here before. The question of gender inequality in the music industries, this is not a new debate by a long shot, right? We've been here before. It comes in waves and then something happens and it loses political traction. If we can actually change the way that our organizations and, and, and sectoral ecologies think and, and conduct their core practice, then I, I really do believe, because I'm an optimist, that we have a shot at doing things differently. So I will... Uh, that is optimistic and I like that. So you may not have found a specific example, but you've spoken of promise and that's a good start. Margaret, do you think there is a culture of change emerging in the way that we're, we're teaching music and music has been learnt so that it is more inclusive beyond gender? I mean, diversity doesn't stop at gender. Mm. Let's, let's start with that. It's so much more intersectional than that. But do you, are you, I mean, from the research that you're doing, do you find that things are looking up I think there is uh, a lot of interest and commitment within music education research to understanding diversity, mm -hmm. to, to understanding the forms of disadvantage and the ways in which it weighs down on students and restricts their mm -hmm. life opportunities. Uh, there's uh, a lot of research that's uh, beginning to look at programs that are being trialled in areas of, of severe disadvantage across the spectrum and looking at ways in which the music education field can become a leader for change, mm. can become a viable force for, for greater social justice. And gender is one aspect of that. But it's, it's a long journey yeah. and, it's, and it's complex. And it's, um, it's a complex system. You can't just tinker at the edge over here and hope that that's going to fix it you actually have to get in under the bonnet and start fossicking around. I've mixed too many metaphors there, but anyhow, <laughs> you've really got to start investing oh, in oh. every single level. Well, um, yes. I thought of one. Okay. okay. Oh, oh. oh, great. As researchers, we're preoccupied with all the things that are broken and wrong. So <laughs> thank you for pushing me to think about something. I really want to give a big shout out. Uh, to Vicky Gordon, who is the CEO of Women in Music in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, she was a key driver behind the report. She has been an absolutely fierceless advocate for putting gender on the agenda and, and making a substantive difference, both in the lives of 
women artists, women musicians, as well as the industry overall. She is a woman who holds people's feet to the fire and makes them accountable. So as I understand it, and we need to update the data in the report, like the ARIA, the Australian mm -hmm. Recording Industry Association Board of Directors is changing. Yeah. We have public commitments to say, right, okay, we're going to address the governance problem. And I think this year, Vicky right now is in the middle of putting together the next live uh, pr production of the Women in Music Awards Australia. Oh, wow. wow. So, you know, like these are really, really important initiatives that are, I hope, giving hope to women musicians and demonstrating leadership. And no, I would agree. And I think it's, again, it's another fitting, a fitting way to end on promise and hope. That's a very exciting thing to know that this is something to look out for. That's acknowledging all the, the differences and all the inequities and, and doing something constructive about it. I'm going to end with one more analogy and pun. Before, just to close, 30 seconds or less, I am bestowing upon you a magic wand slash conductor's baton, and you have one chance to address the music elite and industry and executive. What change would you like to see to trigger change that would see gender, gender equity in the, in the sector? What would you do? I'll start with you, Vanessa. Well, um, the other life-changing moment for me was uh, receiving Australia Council funding, which uh, funded my debut album, which has given me the product to come to festivals, etc., and organisations. Mm -hmm. So I would love to see uh, more Australia Council funding uh, targeted towards emerging female artists. I think that would, help, that would have helped me back in the day when I left university to have had that financial backing. And, uh, yeah, I'd love to see that. Practical, very useful. Mm -hmm. Catherine? I'm going to echo that with yep. more funding in general for mm. emerging female artists, mm. be them composers, conductors, orchestral musicians, soloists. It, we, we, need, we need the funding and, uh, and backing for those emerging individuals. Catherine. I mean, Margaret, sorry. I'm going to go back right to the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need um, a nationwide commitment to music education for infants, uh, young children, that provides access to all, to mm. the experience of music. And in that like process, that. we can model many different ways of being in music. Like but at the moment, looking at the landscape of music education, provision across this country is extraordinarily inequitable. Okay. And there are many gaps mm -hmm. where young children, regardless of their gender or, or situation, have very little access to a sustained and sequential music education. Okay, start them while they're young, I get that. Mm. And last word to you, Amanda, magic wand, 30 seconds. Oh, look, I, I would like to see some really, really radical thinking in how organizations are run and how decisions are made and how programming decisions are taken and like to really, really radically shake things up and experiment and experiment on your main stage with big budgets and do things really, really differently and see what happens, mm -hmm. you know, and that's tied to funding and that's tied to, you know, the investments that we make in the talent uh, and just see what happens, like up your, you know, we did a study uh, a few years ago around um, women directors and people still assuming that women directors are a risk and a key gatekeeper said, we have to get accustomed to taking a risk which is not a risk. Mm -hmm. So we need to interrogate the very concept New of what we think is risky in the first New place. New thinking, so you've heard it. Bold thinking, investment, and start them when they're young. Look, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Margaret, Amanda, and Vanessa for sharing your experiences with us. And on behalf of Equity Trustees, City of Melbourne, and the MSO, I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. As a finale, please enjoy a short excerpt from Vanessa Perica's Love is a Temporary Madness, performed by the Vanessa Perica Orchestra and the Melbourne, the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. Thank you and good night. <laughs>